you have to say, I hope he, uh, I hope that he um, treats them very nicely over Christmas if they manage to, uh, if he manages to win this championship, because uh, he will definitely have them a lot, a lot to thank them for. Because, uh, yeah, I, I think it was a point not even he believed that he could do it at some point. But, you know, that's Formula One for you. That's how brilliant they've been over the last eight years. So the bonuses are going to be worth it, aren't they? <laughs> I certainly yeah. hope it is. Uh, I just, I really hope it is if they manage to pull this off Mercedes. I really do. Because this, you know, sometimes we talk about in the past how the driver can make all the difference. And I still believe it does this year with Lewis. You know, obviously, if Bottas had that car, with all due respect, Max would have been world champion by now. Yep. Um and even if Bottas had the car Lewis had yesterday, I don't think Bottas wouldn't have won yesterday. Wouldn't and Bottas won. wouldn't have got as far as, far as Hamilton did in no. the sprint race. No. Well, we saw what you know, obviously the like Bottas had a fair you know, he couldn't obviously push forward too far, um, in comparison to um oh, uh, Lewis. It, it, sorry, it's, uh, no, I mean for Perez. Um, you know, when Perez was in front of him. Oh, oh yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he couldn't do too much to to get on him, but because um, obviously I assume that they were planning to swap the positions ages ages before that at that point. But I was just like, but he's not he's not getting fast. Like, but but Bottas has shown time and time again in the in that in the same car that he can't he hasn't got that passing ability that Lewis has, especially in traffic. No, I found that amazing about Bottas because he's in the same car in theory under the same circumstances. And how many times have we seen Hamilton dice his way through the field? Obviously not as ridiculous as what he did over the weekend. I mean, that was just another level to anything I think I've ever seen. Um, and yet Bottas in the same car in similar circumstances has quite often struggled, yeah. which has always baffled me. I think it's quite interesting to me. I think it's, it must be demoralizing. I'd say that this weekend has been a bit, I'll probably say it when we're recording the podcast in, in a couple of minutes, but it's, it's got to be demoralizing for Max to just be like, you know, I thought I had it. I thought I'd built up a, a gap that I could just ride that down for the rest of the season. Then Lewis Hamilton comes out and does that. I think this is the first weekend in a long time, maybe at all this season, where Max perhaps thinks I might not win this championship because he's been so unflappable all season and he's meant to, and that's been his biggest attribute this season, how mentally strong he has been despite what happened at Silverstone or Monza or even what he did yesterday. I think for the first time this season, he probably looked at the other guy and thought, he might have me here. If this continues the next couple few races, then he's in trouble. I think after Mexico, he probably thought, I've got this. I just gotta not mess around. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, after 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 the US Grand Prix and Mexico, and then and then I was thinking, obviously, we, from that we're coming off the back of that triple header of Monza, Russia, and oh, there was Spa in there as well, but that doesn't count. Yeah. Um, but you know, but 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 we had the races in um, Zandvoort where Max is just he just walked away with it. Um, Mexico, where he just sailed into the lead at the start and didn't look back. Austin, where he held Hamilton off. He's. It, it is amazing that Max doesn't have as it doesn't have as many points as he did. And if if he wouldn't have had that blowout in um, Baku, he'd 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 have another what seven points on Hamilton. Well, but you probably how many did Lewis score points on that day? No, 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 because no, he actually yeeted it into turn oh. one, didn't he? Oh, no, I know, I can't remember if he finished in the got, got back in the. No, points. he didn't. Oh, it would have been twenty five, wouldn't it? Because he would have won that race. So yeah, but but also I'm I'm being, I'm I'm also thinking that we wouldn't have had a race restart where Hamilton wouldn't have true, had his brake bias. Oh, so yeah. it would have been what ten points at something like that. Yeah, give or take one or one either way for fastest lap. Mm. Um, yeah. But uh, but Max also walked away the winner in Monza, even though he got a three place grid penalty, because he got he got pole for the sprint, mm. so he got three points there. And I think if Max does win the championship, I think he needs to, they need to look at Russia as probably the turning point mm. side of the yeah. back of the grid. And imagine if imagine if you Lewis, you've just won your hundredth race in circumstances like that. And then you look to your right and you see Max rolling at P2. Yeah, it's one of those things of like, yeah, it'd be happy to have won the race, but you won't be happy to see just off the step, you know, on the second step of the podium is your main championship rival when you were looking to get, you know, a big scalp, of, uh, like, yeah, big whole load of points. Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, that has been Max Verstappen to a T this season, even under 
whatever adversity that Mercedes and Hamilton have thrown at him until Brazil, of course, he's always had an answer for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and granted, Red Bull have pro- produced an incredible piece of machinery for him for most of the season. But I'll be honest with you guys, uh, people saying now that they're rocking up with the fastest car, I, I just don't think that's going to be the case now. So what do they do now? If, if Hamilton continues with what he's doing, what do Red Bull do? Unless they find something on that car, which is not permitted within the current technical directives, which they suspect they have, but we'll have to wait and see. I can't see how Red Bull are going to be able to counter that pure speed that Mercedes have. And now that Hamilton has got available to him. So, and we're going to free circuits where there's going to be, he's going to be able to make use of that quite a lot. So, uh, I mean, I've, put, uh, I've, I've just had a run round of Jeddah and it's, it, 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 you need straight line speed there. Oh, Jeddah's as much as a Mercedes track as I think I'm going to see this season. Um, I, unless Red Bull's low drag setup that they did so well at France and Austria with is able to match it, which I don't even think that's going to be possible, but we'll just have to wait and see. But, uh, yeah. yeah, it could come down to what happens this weekend and maybe what happens in Abu Dhabi with the changes to their circuits. You know, will that hinder the ladies? Because there's a lot of 90 degree corners there, which I think could be right up Red Bull. taken some out though. They have, but in the final sector, I think that's going to be where Red Bull will do well. I think the middle sector, other that, than the two, you know... It, it the, yeah, the, the, the middle, sorry, yeah, the, sorry the, the middle sector, other than that kink between the two straights, that is going to be Mercedes. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I'm kind of because I was talking to my um, my co-host the other day about this because um, obviously the change happened at Abu Dhabi, particularly in the first sector and certain parts of the middle part of the lap. Um, but I said to him, you know, even though Mercedes have had a lot of joy there, the pre turbo hybrid era was it was a Red Bull haven, um, and certain characteristics that have transpired over to this current car will help them along. The question will be is, you know. Can will that play out for Red Bull or not? I mean, I hope it does to the point where it equalizes the pair of them both of their strengths. Um, because I think we all want to see it go down to the last race. And if we can go to a circuit like that where it plays to both teams to the point where they're dead level, then it's up to the drivers. Um, and they could be level one points going into that race. So we'll have to see. It's just it's just the luck we get, you know. We come to like that. That would be a fitting end to this season, though. It mm. would, wouldn't the, it? You know, the most fitting of ends. Yeah. Right. Should we crack on? I was going to yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> I should just carry on from this. <laughs> Tom's in the chat. I've just seen him. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Uh, let's bump this quality down. Right, okay. Fresh off the back of a stunning weekend at Interlagos and into the unknown as we arrive in Qatar to finish this triple head off, a triple header off in a calendar move designed to put all teams on the back foot. And they say Liberty Media doesn't deliberately induce drama. Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast. Hosting today will be me, Owen Medford, and joining me are Tom Downey from, the, uh, from Everything F1. Hello. And Adam Burns from the F- DNF1 podcast. Hello. Right, today we will be previewing the uh, previewing the upcoming Qatar Grand Prix, a venue we've never been to before, uh, as as part of the Formula One World Championship. Um, but before we get into that, uh, we're just now streaming the we're streaming the show live on YouTube, and uh, so be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Formula One Grid Talk, uh, to be. Uh, notified when we go live uh, just make sure you also ring the bell icon so that you're notified of future shows right so we've just come off the back of a pretty pretty hectic sort of race weekend um i think and i don't think anyone expected what we uh what we saw basically you know, it's a performance that you know particularly from lewis hamilton that's <laughs> so I'm, uh, what i'm talking about is you know ridiculous championship saving i would say um the thing is, you know, we we didn't think going in. We we thought going into sort of into Lagos that um, it would be a sort of it would be Red Bulls to 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 lose really, and it kind of was, I would say. Um, but Mercedes just seemed to have pulled out another level um, going into going into Qatar, where we've never really been before. Um, I just want to throw it to you, Adam. But uh, this circuit, from what we've seen, you know, I've, I've just just trying to prepare for it. I mean, we don't really know too much about it um just I've, I've been watching the MotoGP it doesn't it doesn't look like so much of a uh 
of a of a of a racing car circuit. Obviously, it's designed for MotoGP. Um, I would liken it to Bahrain. Um, do you think Mercedes are going to go so strongly there, or do you reckon it might come to Red Bull with the sort of twisty section in the middle sector? It's a really tough one to wine to call. I mean, a lot of um, some of the more well known media personalities involved in F1 seem to go with the opinion that Mercedes are the ones that should have the advantage when you consider all of the aspects of this circuit. Um, it's a really strange one, this circuit, the Lasali one. Of course, it was brought in uh, as a last minute pr- replacement for the Japanese Grand Prix, I believe, and um, or uh, along that sort of time. And as you said, the characteristics of this circuit, it's very much a MotoGP circuit. It's a circuit that we're probably not going to see on the F1 calendar once uh, Qatar hosts the Grand Prix on a regular basis from 2023. Um, you know, so we'll have to wait and see how that goes. But as far as the Lasali circuit goes, of course, you've got that long back straight, which I think everybody is talking about. I think it's about one kilometer long. So we're talking similar lengths to the likes of um, something like what we get in China, at the circuit in Shanghai, or even Baku, that long back straight there. So that is going to be the section where we're going to see most of the overtaking. And of course, why a lot of people think Mercedes, especially based on what we saw this weekend in Brazil, should fancy themselves. And of course, that's going to be music to Lewis Hamilton's ears. In that middle sector, as you mentioned, it's going to be a lot tighter and twistier as the MotoGP riders will be much more akin to. And as we've seen at some circuits this year, like in Portimao or Mugello the season before, that will be an area where it'll be harder to overtake. So that should play to Red Bull strengths, although there are some medium to high speed corners. So Mercedes won't lose out as much as uh, it might have first feared. So going into this race, if I was to pick a team that's going to fancy this circuit, I think overall you've got to go with the Mercedes right now and this newfound speed that's in Lewis Hamilton's hand, which is a very scary thought if you are affiliated in any way with Max Verstappen and Red Bull. Yeah, speaking of, uh, I'll I'll move to you, Tom. I know you're a a Max Verstappen fan. Um, Do you think, you know, I don't do, there, obviously, there's been a lot been said by Red Bull specifically over the uh, over the Mercedes rear wing, um, not just in relation to the uh, to the disqualification on um, on Saturday for Lewis Hamilton, but um, you know with some flexibility. Uh, do you think maybe those hold water? And uh, and if and if they do, do you reckon you know um, Red Bull will put in a protest or or maybe even try and sort of get one over on Mercedes? Uh, do, you know, basically, do you think they can take the fight to them really? Uh, you're asking a Red Bull fan whether you think Red Bull are going to put in a protest. Even as a Red Bull fan, I have to say yes, given their given their sort of track record with things. Um, as to whether they can take the fight to Mercedes, poor. If you'd have asked me pre-Brazil, I'd have said bring it on. You're asking me post-Brazil, uh, I'm quaking in my Red Bull can. It's um, yeah, the 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 just general car advantage that Mercedes seem to have and the momentum is swinging back that way. It's, um, it's pretty tense at the moment, but you know, for, for Red Bull, when, you know, when they're fighting Mercedes and going to the sort of twilight of the season, uh, that, uh, the La Salle circuit has got what I think, I think it's just over a kilometer main straight, which is, going to be the DRS though, and I can't really see any, anywhere else we're going to have DRS this weekend. Um, that Mercedes, if it is behind someone, even a Red Bull, if, it, if it's got DRS, it is going to sail past pretty much anything, I'd imagine. Especially if Hamilton has got the sort of driver motivation he had in, from the weekend just gone, because he was driving like something almost possessed. And um, I'm not going to go into that because we've covered it already. But um, I do think I think Red Bull might be on the back foot this weekend. And like Adam mentioned earlier, they're going to have to have a storming what's probably going to be middle sector or end of first sector into second and maybe a touch of third sector. Basically, the bit that isn't the straight, I think that's going to favour the Red Bull. But I don't know if they're going to be able to make up as much of a difference as they need to because that Merck is going to absolutely blast on the straights. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I 100% agree with everything you said there. Um, now, earlier this year, uh, Adam, uh, I read I read an article, where, or I think it was just one of the pundits, basically. It was around Portugal time that someone said that, you know, Max Verstappen is finding out how good Lewis Hamilton really is. That was obviously when Mercedes might have been a little bit stronger at that period of time. Um, 
do you think that now it's becoming uh, you know I, I, I that was always lost a bit lost on me at that point but do you think it is really becoming for Max Verstappen you know after seeing um after seeing Lewis Hamilton just kind of almost eat him up um do you think it, he's really out, sort of finding out yeah Lewis Hamilton is really good there's a reason he's a seven-time world champion and um and going into this weekend what do you think that he can do really to to defend this championship or or is it do you, do you think that maybe there's almost a morale that's just just been taken away from him and he might not have that unflappability that we've seen him have um, all season long, basically? Well, I think Max has always been aware of how good Lewis Hamilton is. Um, the way that Max has driven this season, mentally, he has been as tough as nails. We've not seen hardly at all Max been put into a position where he's feeling the pressure or at least shows that he's feeling the pressure. I mean, we're talking about a guy here that has never won a world championship in open wheel racing or at least in cars. Um, and it's quite remarkable, you know, despite his immense talent, that how he's able to handle the pressure to such a degree. I think the first time that we saw this season that Max Verstappen started to worry that he may not win this championship or feel the pressure was at Brazil when Lewis Hamilton was all over the back of him and, of course, forced Max into that over-aggressive defensive move that obviously wasn't punished by the FA, not that it mattered um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but I think it was just that sign that we saw with Max, a little bit of desperation creeping in, creeping in. And Lewis Hamilton will sense that um, going into these final races because he may feel that if he's got the advantage over Max, um, Lewis is as strong as anybody at playing the mental game as he is behind the wheel. Um, he's just a lot more subtle about it. That's part of the, the enigma of Lewis Hamilton, if you like. You know, he's always almost like a full sense of security that you think, oh, you know, he comes across as a nice guy. He's respectful to his opponents, etc., and to the crowd. You know, he's harmless. But then getting behind the wheel, he's as brilliant as there's ever been in Formula One. And that can be quite um, a scary trait, especially when you've got a car as quick as he seems to have right now. And, you know, going into this circuit, um, it's going to have all those characteristics, as I've already said, that should help Hamilton further and Mercedes like we saw in Brazil. Um, it, it's going to be a big ask for Max Verstappen. In terms of what he can do, um, the only advice I can give to Max um, on what he can do is basically try and do what he did at Brazil. Not necessarily the defensive driving, but defend as hard as he can, race as fast as he can, as he did for most of that weekend. And, and it must be said, you know, the fact that Lewis didn't just breeze past him at the first opportunity is, um, it does play tribute to how good Max has been this season. I think he's been phenomenal. Um, you know, everyone else, Hamilton just breezed past as if they were standing still. But it did take him a little while longer to get Max. Eventually, he did. Um, so Max has just got to try and do what he's been doing. Make sure he doesn't make any mistakes. Um, and he hardly makes those anymore this season as well. So that's another bow to his quiver, if you like. Um, and, and just hope that Hamilton doesn't have the performance advantage that he clearly had um it, at the brazilian grand prix and just hope that hamilton's not on his a plus game that he was at that weekend as well yeah 100 percent um yeah i think it, you know it's unfair to say that max has been bad uh you know they, they've we've been both seen well sorry we've seen them both be absolutely excellent and uh and you know with with the way that the standings are now um it's only what's well, it 14 points i believe between the two uh it's going to come down to the wire um, of course, to do that, we're going to need to we're going to need some teammates because you know it, it it would be remiss of us to 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 go over the fact that you know Perez and Bottas um, have uh, have really made a difference to this season. Um, I think I will start with Bottas, really, uh, Tom. Um, do you think you know? Obviously, he, he got out of the way very very quickly for Lewis Hamilton. You know, I, I assume that was pre planned. Um, do you think he? Well, I was going to say, obviously he's going to do everything he can to help Mercedes. Um, do you think he can? He can sort of, uh, I would say, do that. It's not really a track that suits him, just based on looking at the, track, uh, the map layout. I don't think Qatar's going to suit him. Um, do you think he's going to run well, or do you think he's maybe going to be a bit more further adrift than he has been to uh, to uh, the, basically the rest of the leading pack? Asking if Bottas is going to run well is asking like which finger you want cut off first. I mean, <laughs> you know, he's 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 just he's just mentally checked out, isn't he? You know, he, he, even though he did have good run of form, he goes win his Turkey. Um, you know, he's just not 
he, he's just different gravy to Hamilton, and he's Bisto, and Hamilton is homemade. You know, so that's a reference I never thought I'd say. Um, I, I think the car will complement him this weekend. I've got a picture of the circuit map open to my right, so if I keep looking, it's because I'm realising it's even not as twisty as I thought it was. Um, and I can see even more areas where Mercedes are just going to cane it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if if he gets a good toe off someone, um, I, I could I could see him perhaps putting in some good moves this weekend. But realistically, I I don't think there's going to be much from him, and I don't think the Red Bull is going to be of the Red Bull of Perez, I should say, is going to be close enough to really give him give him a battle. And I wouldn't be surprised. If we just see Bottas driving round a fairly lowly third, yeah, that's fair, bro. Um, I'm glad you brought up Perez. It sort of helped me segue into this. Um, you know, obviously he's uh, he's he's in it for the long haul at, uh, at Red Bull, to, uh, Adam. Um, do you, I'm just thinking, sort of thinking. Um, I think he's going to be like if we if we go with the idea that yeah, Mercedes is going to be faster. Um, how key is he going to be? Uh, I know it's a silly question, but. You know, it, it, to my mind, he's absolutely essential if the Mercedes is that much faster. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, ultimately, there was not much Perez could do about Lewis Hamilton. I mean, we had a great battle that we saw between the two where Perez did manage to get Lewis back quite early on, and that was quite fun to watch um, in, in that race. But um, I'll be honest with you guys, I think the same will go for Bottas in this regard as well. But, um, I mean, Paris was quite unlucky in Brazil. Uh, if it wasn't for the safety car, there's every reason to believe he might have been able to finish ahead of Bottas. Would Bottas have got Perez? Clearly, he didn't have the performance in his car that Hamilton did, owing to the fresh power unit that Lewis had amongst everything else and how good Lewis had, was in that race. Um, so, you know, there's every reason to believe that if it weren't for the safety car, Perez might have had a chance to keep P3. So what it comes down to, ultimately with Perez and Bottas is if this weekend goes as it did in Brazil, where they have a massive advantage over everyone else behind them, whichever one is going to be in fourth place, if they can afford to, uh, we'll just take a pit stop and take the fastest lap off of either one of Max or Lewis, depending on which one it is um, for the sake of the championship. I think that is what their role is going to be now. I think Max and Lewis are just driving to a level at this point, as we've seen for most of the season where, they're just completely untouchable, even to their own teammates in the same car. So, you know, with respect to Perez and Bottas, who obviously have their own roles to play in the Constructors' Championship, and of course, a mini battle between each other, which of course will keep them going, it's literally going to be who can take the fastest lap off of either one of Lewis or Max, um, just to preserve the Drivers' Championship, um, depending on which way it goes. So uh, I would love to talk them up more, but, you know, Lewis and Max are in a completely different league to their teammates. So there's, they're only going to be able to be effective in a limited capacity from what I can see from here on out. Yeah, it looks like it's a constructor's battle only at this point, you know, as we've seen, as you say, you know, it's been a class of two, really, the entire season. Uh, you know, I don't think that's going to change. I think that's the, that's the sentiment coming out now. Um, we're now going to move to the front of the midfield, uh, which is a bit more interesting, um, but also somehow not. Uh, <laughs> right, we've got Ferrari. Um who have really come on strong in the last few races, really made some strides, um, doing almost a Mercedes-level optimization of the car in uh, in ways that I wouldn't have, um, I think I've said before, but I wouldn't have predicted this to, uh, a year and a half ago. Um, do you think, uh, do you think, Tom, that bearing in mind, you know, the, the speed that uh, that Ferrari seem to have, um, do you think? Do you think that they can get their drivers ahead of the uh, ahead of Norris in the drivers' championship and really start to show, show, you know, that they are they are best of the rest. They are in, coming into a to next year with a very very strong position. Um, or do you think it's go, it's not going to be um, so suitable for them uh, at Qatar? I do wonder and maybe hope that McLaren will be further ahead this weekend. Given that Mercedes unit in the back and given the sort of nature of the track, I do think it's going to benefit. Um, I do think it's going to benefit both Norris and Danny Rick this weekend. If Ferrari do manage to get a driver ahead and keep a driver ahead, that is a massive statement for the Constructors' Championship. You know, that is for Ferrari really saying, look, we are taking third. If you want it, you've got to come and fight us for it. Um, I think they semi did that in Brazil anyway, with with them finishing P five and P six. 
but if if they can do that, if they can do that in Qatar, in what should be a Mercedes oriented car circuit, I was trying to get my words right then. Um, if you know, if, if Ferrari can get the upper hand, I think they'll have all but won the psychological battle with McLaren. I think McLaren will be a bit resigned to fourth. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. You know, if they can get ahead of Qatar, I think that's going to end the championship, barring, you know, some catastrophic failures on the Ferrari end. Um, Now, the question I have really about McLaren is uh, for you, Adam. um, Do you think maybe they've been almost holding back um, or not so much holding back, but doing similar to uh, what we expected of Mercedes and some of the other teams this year, which is, um, I would say, you know, obviously we've got a big rule change coming up. you know, do, do you think they're going to sort of base it? I guess the question is, do you think they're going to continue their form? Do you reckon they've been backing off in preparation for next year's car? Or do you reckon they can sort of regain their mojo? Um, and if not, you know, get a regain certain the constructors with uh, some good performances for Norris and Ricardo. Uh, just, you know, get a little closer almost just to, you know, finish off the season on a high or at least um, get back to more winning ways. It's a really tough one because... Um they had their incredible height Monza where they finished one and two. And of course, Ricardo getting an extra point in the sprint as well. So it was even better for McLaren that weekend. But since then, it's completely fallen away for them. Um, Lando Norris, of course, should have won in Sochi. But if it wasn't for what happened on the team radio, and the confusion there, he probably would have done. Um, and they almost got next to nothing at that race. And, you know, since then, Norris, I mean, last weekend, Norris was more himself. You know, he did well in the sprint race to get ahead of um, Charles Leclerc, who was bogged down, of course, by following Perez and uh, and Sainz. And then he was, you know, if it wasn't for that mistake he made, perhaps leaning over a little bit at the start, which was, it was unlucky as well. It must be said, um, you know, it, it could have easily been Carlos Sainz that got the puncher and it would have wrecked his race in the same way. So Lando was incredibly unlucky. But that being said, um, with his sort of, mid to end of season funk that he's been going through since Sochi. And of course, Ricardo's form has been up and down, up and down. And then it was incredibly up. And then we thought it might continue. And now it's gone back down again to where he's struggling to even get into the points. It is quite a worry for McLaren. Um, in terms of their overall calm and where their priorities are, of course, you know, like practically everyone else at this point in the season, it is swifted towards 2022. Um, that being said, of course, we don't know who you know, blinked first in terms of Ferrari and McLaren. I think for argument's sake, let's assume they did it at the exact same time and focused their resources at the same time to those sorts of projects. So we'll find out next year who's got it right and who hasn't. Um, But that being said, I think all season long, uh, Ferrari, uh, if you took the engines out of the cars, I think Ferrari had a better package than McLaren. And, And bear in mind, McLaren were quite limited with what they could actually do with their car development because of the tokens they had to exchange in order to get that Mercedes power unit in the back of their car. So they were quite limited on developing the car. And of course, Ferrari had a lot of weak areas that they were able to address um, because of how bad the car was last season. So, you know, you put all that together and it's taken Ferrari a while to really find their own mojo and their drivers to really be consistent and for them not to make mistakes and for them to have this completed power unit for 2021, which has taken up until the Russian Grand Prix for the electrical components to be a part of that spec, which is why they took the engine penalties that they're in Turkey, to now have the full package, which has seen them completely, not only, you know, get ahead of McLaren, but they've left them in the dust, for lack of a better way for putting it. So as far as McLaren are concerned, yeah, of course, they should keep trying. Um, they do need to be better, but it just seems that there's a lot of things going on at McLaren this towards the end of this season where their impressive early season form has fallen away. And at the same time, Ferrari have just hit, you know, maximum power, if you like, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, they've hit their purple patch. Their drivers are driving superbly. They're working together as a team, um, even if it doesn't sound like it on the radio all the time. And right now, McLaren, they're just at dire straits right now. I think next season it will get better. But I think in terms of this Constructors' Championship, unless something happens miraculously in their favour to turn things around, I think Ferrari have got the Constructors' Championship, as far as P3 is concerned, in the bag. And we could see not just Leclerc, but also Carlos Sainz overtake Lando in the Drivers' Championship, which was completely unthinkable at the earlier part of the season, considering how good Lando has been. It is mad to think, sorry to jump in, it is mad to think that for quite a while we thought that Norris was going to be dead set for P3 in the championship and now he's 
slipped to P5 and he's at risk of being swallowed up by one, if not both, of the Ferrari drivers. I mean, if you think back to, was it only the second race of the season, I think, where he went purple in all three sectors to put it P2, only to have the time disqualified, uh, have the time deleted for, I think it was track limits, uh, possibly at Imola, I think it was. Yeah, if, you think, if you think back to then and, and just how well Ferrari have done to repair the damage that was done by their 2020 season, um, you know, for them to get back to P3, that is a monumental effort. Yeah, it's clearly something in the water at Maranello and uh, and maybe not so much in Woking. Um, right, we get to sort of the more fun battles really now, um, where we've got uh, Alpine Renault, um, who are tied on points. I'll sort of bind these two together. I think, you know, it's, it's sort of becoming, you know, we can see where the, f- the fights have now uh, have now solidified up to. Um, and now we uh, we can sort of compare two teams directly, uh, which is quite nice for me, to be honest. Um, so we've got Alpine Renault, and then uh, and then we've got the Alpha Tories. Um, and now Alpine didn't do so sort of amazingly. They actually only scored the, exactly the same points as Pierre Gasly, and obviously Yuki Tsunoda had that very clumsy, in my opinion, uh, move uh, on Lance Stroll that basically ended his race and and was probably um, severely impacted the uh, the constructors because that seems to be where it's at really now for. Uh, for the, for them, um, I'll go to you, Tom. Uh, I mean, who do you see coming out on top here? Um, you know, obviously there's, a, you know, the slight change in form, uh, uh, slight change in circumstances. But um, you know, Yuki did well. Yuki uh, Sano did well in uh, in Bahrain. Um, do you think maybe uh, he can he can do better and uh, and help the team? You know, who basically who do you think is going to come out on top uh, as as a constructor in uh, out of Qatar? In Qatar, I think um, I think although Renault will have both drivers in between the AlphaTauri drivers, I think they will come out on top because Yuki is you know you mentioned about the collision he had with Stroll, so that was that really was a rookie move that you know to, to coin Martin Brundle's favorite phrase, he was a day late and a dollar short going into that turn. Um, I sorry, no, I still maintain myself a Martin Brund, Martin Brundle bingo card for all the phrases he says. Um, but yeah, but that, that that move was never on. And yes, Hamilton did that sensational move on, I think, Norwich in the sprint. Yuki is not Hamilton. He's been in the sport for one season and he's still adapting to a car that is, whilst it's a decent car, it's not a Mercedes. Um, and it won't ever be a Mercedes. Uh yeah, Yuki ruined his own race. He ruined Stroll's car. Did you see that bit of carbon fiber that flew out down the main straight? And Crofty said, oh, there goes the rest of the Alpha Tauri's front wing. Because I think it was, it was what caused one of the virtual safety cars. It was an enormous piece of carbon fiber that came out. Um, yeah, he, he shouldn't have stuck his nose in there. And I hope it doesn't dent his confidence too much because he needs a bit of confidence and he needs a decent run for the remainder of the season. Um if Alfa Tauri want to even think about beating Alpine, they need to know the scoring points. Gasly cannot do it all himself. And the Renault drivers have been pretty consistent in terms of they've been sort of there or thereabouts. You know, obviously, they had the massive high in Hungary, coming P1 and P3 after Seb's disqualification. Um, but if, if Alfa Tauri want to wrap up fifth in the constructors, which I think will go down to the last race. Um, Alpha Tauri need Sonoda in Q3. They need him getting points, even if it's just eight point, two points. They need those points because Gazi can't do it all himself. He's doing a mighty fine effort, but it's rare that you see two. It's rare you see one driver drag a constructor over over another team that's got two drivers scoring points. Yeah, I think as you say, it's basically key. Um, I, was, I, I kind of want to keep going on it on, on Yuki a bit. Um, do you think that sort of? I'll go I, on in it. I'll go in on him if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not but... people going on him this season. You know, more closer to home, but uh, yeah, he looks like he needs a cuddle, Yuki, doesn't he? Just to tell him everything's going to be okay and try and go again next season. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I mean we we kind of hijacked that but um but it, 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 you know to, to carry on the, the point about Yuki 
He just needs a winter break. Um, and I've mentioned it time and time again. Let's not forget he's in the Red Bull Driver Academy. It's notorious for being just ruthless with letting drivers go. I mean, what was it? Christian Horner came out and said after Mexico that he ruined qualifying for uh, for Max and, and Checo. It's just like, well, that's not going to do Yuki any favours. Yeah, OK, it didn't help because it probably did put them off um, when you look at it. But don't say it publicly. Have a word with him. You're supposed to be mentoring him. You know, just, just give him a bit of a break. Just in, in, instead of berating him, teach him. You, you know, nurture him. You know, you, you know, just it's it's it, hanging him out to dry in public is not going to help him. And all it's going to do is push his confidence further down, which means he's going to get more desperate onto track, more desperate on track to look like he's doing something proper. And then we know what happens. Then you overdrive, you make mistakes, you'll get a bit of a tank slapper, you'll, you'll oversteer, and you'll hit the wall. Yeah, hundred um, percent. It's it's actually interesting to think almost that this championship could have been decided by uh, by a Red Bull driver slamming into the side of a, a Mercedes powered car, um, you know, and and basically making life an awful lot easier for Lewis Hamilton uh, compared to uh, compared to Max Verstappen. Um, speaking of that Mercedes powered car, we've got uh, Aston Martin. Um, it's a pretty lowly place that they're sitting in themselves right now, uh, Adam. It's you know they're they're as as a team they're seventh in the constructors, um, they're nigh on sixty points. Uh, sorry, they're nigh on fifty points. Sorry, uh, behind the Alpha Tories and uh, and Alpine Renaults ahead, um, and obviously there there's no way that Williams are catching them. Um, you know, is it essentially a test session at this point for them? You know, for these last three races, you know, particularly Qatar though. Um, is it you know what what is what is there for them to do really? Well, they're certainly still trying. Um, at least in Sebastian Vettel's case, it looked a bit more promising in Mexico. Uh, they were caught out on strategy there. And they were caught out on strategy again uh, this weekend, just gone in Brazil. Um, I mean, one of the biggest strengths that we've seen from Alpine this season, I think, which obviously, you know, Tom was mentioning earlier, uh, that will serve them well in this fight with Alpha Tauri, which is gone off on a tangent a little bit, is how brilliant they have been at seizing the opportunity. When it is a right, right I can't think of a team that has seized the opportunity better in a random race than um, Alpine with respect. I mean, Hungary, you know, that they seized that opportunity and they won that race and, you know, nearly got two cars on the podium if it wasn't for Lewis Hamilton being Lewis Hamilton. Um, and then, of course, you had the Turkish race where Esteban Ocon did the no-stop and ended up getting in the points when he was nowhere in that race. And then as we saw this weekend, they did the one-stop, which everyone was saying, oh, you're not going to be able to do the one-stop. The safety car come out. And uh, they ended up doing 30-odd laps on the hard tyres and ended up uh, nicking two points finishes where Sebastian Vettel and the Aston Martin were caught out by the strategy and they finished P11. It was just how it goes. And I think for Aston Martin, they will rue so much this season. They will probably forget 2021 and say, this season didn't happen in our memory bank. Our real debut starts in 2022, the real Aston Martin project. Because from the start of the season, even before it's begun, everything was going wrong for them. They had the rule changes, which of course hurt them more than anybody else um, because they didn't understand the car like the Mercedes understand their car because, you know, for obvious reasons. And they just couldn't work around it. So they've had to work really hard to try and get to a point now where they can feel like they're on top of their car to a degree whilst focusing on the project next year. And hopefully that will, you know, bring better results for them. But there have been so many days now where, as we've already said, Aston Martin have just felt like, everything's going wrong for them or the performance isn't there and they've fallen away from the likes of Alpha Tauri and Alpine and of course Ferrari and McLaren ahead of them which you know this time last season they had the third fastest car on the grid so for them I suppose you could say it's somewhat of a test session there are some 2022 components that they could test I mean Ferrari were uh, testing some brake duct modifications that they could use on the 2022 car um, in Mexico which obviously, you know, was quite encouraging from what they said. So there is some scope for teams like Aston Martin to try certain components on the 2022 car that are within the rules this season to help them along. And um, we could see them do that a little bit more. In terms of the overall results, I think it's just a confidence booster, really. You know, Sebastian Vettel will just keep doing what he's doing. Um, Lance Stroll probably needs to find some form. He's sort of fallen away in the second half of this season. 
Um, but he has had his bad luck as well. I mean, as we saw with Sonoda, it just it, the guy just cannot seem to catch a break either. So for them, they will obviously want to cast this season to the memory bank and not think about it anymore or tell it as a ghost story, if you like, uh, every Halloween about how bad the 2021 <laughs> season has been. Um, but hopefully better days are ahead for Aston Martin, but um, they'll just be going to the races as they are and just hope to do the best job that they can, really. Yeah, I think that's all they can do. Um, now, another team that's sort of fallen from grace a little bit, just in this season alone, you know, we we, we saw some actually fairly good performances from them um, beforehand, when, you know, sort of in the mid part of the season, but they've kind of fallen back quite a lot now, uh, is Williams. Um, I, again, they, they're, they're also in a similar position to Aston Martin. Uh, do you think it's all hands on deck for 2022 at this point for Williams? You know, do, uh, they need to... You know, it's it's been a long while since we've seen a, a Williams anywhere near the front, and um, you know, is it kind of throw the rest of the season away, or do you think maybe they can come back? I mean, they 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 said they lost a bit of form, Tom. Um, you know, uh, obviously through the last couple of races, um, but the the next few races might sort of uh, you know, there's there's opportunity there. I would say um, to to move forward. Do you think do you think the same way or? Uh, I think Williams have probably realised that they're not realistically going to catch um, Aston Martin in seventh, and equally they're probably safe enough to Alfa Romeo that they don't really need to think about what's behind them in that sense. <sighs> if I was Williams, I, I think the results they had in the result they had in Hungary that was a crazy race. Um, I'm not taking anything away from it, but it wasn't it wasn't that they got there on outright merit and outright pace. And I can feel the pitchforks being sharpened as I say that. Um if you're same, sharpening your pitchfork, I just want to say, I'm sorry, but that's that's not a controversial statement. The Williams aren't quick. <laughs> no, yeah, the, the, they're not quick. And don't get me, I know people like George Russell, and seeing him in the points was fantastic. It was brilliant for his career, and I it did him no end of favours and getting that Mercedes drive, which I think we all knew was coming regardless. And then we look at um, uh, Belgium, knew the race that wasn't a race. Don't get me wrong, Russell did an insane job in the wet, um, but they always say that rain is a sort of great equaliser. And it's like, if Lando would have made it without having his quite scary crash good chance that he'd have been P2 or P1 and Russell would have perhaps been a place or two further down the order. But again, uh, I, I think if, if if we'd have had a race, the Williams would have probably dropped a fair bit back in that race. Um, so the results are a bit exaggerated. But on the flip side, they have the points they have. And he has got into P3 on Merit. I believe he did it in Austria, possibly. in this, I think it was in the second Austrian race because I believe the first one, you missed out by someone like two thousandths of a second or something it was. It was something ridiculously close. And going off on a tangent here, I don't think Williams are going to really develop anything. I think it's going to be all hands on deck for 2022. Having said that, we know they're not bringing a car to the end of season test for, I think they said, because they felt it wouldn't be of any benefit, which you'd have thought, given you've got a driver who hasn't driven single season for a year, Coming back, you'd want to stick him in the car, surely. Um, or maybe he doesn't. Or maybe he doesn't qualify for the young driver test because I think you have to, you have, to have had a two year gap, which is why Alonso, at the at the young age of thirty eight or thirty nine, was able to have a young driver test last year. Um, point being, yes, they are going to focus on twenty twenty two from from now on. They are fairly solid in the position they're in. Um, I think aside from any power unit upgrades from Mercedes, there's not going to be anything which is going to be um, an aero tweak, I don't think. Mm, yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of Willie Williams are pretty secure where they are. So uh, yeah, I agree with hundred percent what you said there. Um, Adam, moving forward, we've got uh, Alfa Romeo, and uh, and I don't really want to talk too much about. Uh, Kimi Raikkonen. Well, who I want to talk about mostly is uh, is Antonio Giovinazzi. Um, now, the night we're recording this on the fifteenth, if you're listening after the fact, uh, but 
it, there's been rumours swirling. I don't know if it's confirmed or not. Um, but apparently the decision has been made for the second driver for uh, for Alfa Romeo. Um, based on your the, the performance of Antonio Giovinazzi, basically, uh, in the uh, over the sort of weekend in Sao Paulo, do you think do you think that's made anything? You know, do I think that's changed the decision at all, or do you think he's he, he's not going to be partnering uh, uh, Valtteri Bottas next season? I mean, it's a decision that's been probably been made for some time. Um, obviously, there was a lot of indecision over it all, over the Andretti situation, which obviously never came to fruition. Um, and that would have certainly changed uh, the scene. And of course, there's been a lot of delays in the background with who we expect to be confirmed as the uh, Alfa Romeo driver for next season in Guan Yu Zhou. So, you know, that was never straightforward to get that deal done either. So for, for Giovinazzi, we've seen a few moments where he has impressed and shown signs that there is a very quick driver in there. I mean, I think, you know, the problem for someone like Giovinazzi is that nobody is denying that he's not a good driver and that there isn't something in Formula One that he can offer to a team. The problem is, is that it's just been so few and far between. It's not been consistent enough. And whilst you could argue that year on year, there has been some level of improvement. We're talking about a guy who is still struggling at the very, very least to maintain a good performance over the cross of the entire weekend, you know, who have a good qualifying or get into a good position early in the race and then just fall away. And you think, well, you know, that was fun while it lasted, but it never, you know, never comes to fruition or anything like that. And of course he's been struggling to keep up with Kimmy. I mean, look at the last race, you know, Kimmy started from the pit lane. And he still finished ahead of his teammate um, quite convincingly. You know, Kimi always seems to find himself in the points paying positions or at least on the fringes of it. Giovinazzi, very, very less often you find him in that position. So whilst I am dis- sad a little bit to see Gio looking like he's going to lose his seat in F1, I can't really defend and say he's done enough to keep it. And it seems harder now than ever to keep your seat in Formula One if you are on the fringes of losing it and um, given how competitive the grid is these days is as good as it's probably ever been and how many people are knocking on the door I mean there's so many good drivers that you could put in that seat that aren't going to be in that seat next season someone like Oscar Piastri rings to mind um, maybe Teo Porcher in a few years time and yet you know Giovinazzi I wouldn't exactly put him ahead of those two either I'd rather take the chance on those guys so um, there's always a future outside of Formula One for Giovinazzi but uh, he's not done enough in my opinion over the last three or four years to keep that seat beyond this season. It's been coming, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Alfa Romeo is, uh, is, uh, is going to be hanging on to a Giovinazzi. I, I loaded the question there, but it was deliberate. And uh, um, yeah, it's just kind of, uh, you know, Formula One's a, a, a you know, Formula One's a, a Oh, I can't remember the quote. I it's can't a remember cruel the quote. Mistress. Yeah, it's a cruel. Oh, yeah, it's it's a uh, you know, it's a it's something not a finishing school, basically. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're. Pro- I know what you mean. You're absolutely right. It's not. Um, but I mean, with all respect, I mean, in Guan Yu Zhou, what they are getting um, it is you know an experienced driver. Or he's been around the junior categories for a while now. A driver that I've personally thought should have made the step up into Formula One, probably before he would eventually do. Um, not the number one choice, but I think a solid number two for Valtteri Bottas next season and hopefully can play a part with the financial backing that, of course, he will bring to the Alfa Romeo team to sort of help them along with their short to medium term project with Bottas for the next few years, which hopefully in their minds will take them, um, I suppose, to a position in the midfield that they'll be able to flourish a little bit more in the championship points and maybe on a rare day, maybe try and get a podium rather than languishing at the back where they are at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the 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 direction for uh, for Alfa Romeo has to be forward. Otherwise, we might see Sauber unfortunately go the same way as as well. You know, some some other teams are, uh, that have uh, dropped off the back of the grid in the in, in the last twenty or thirty years. Um, after that, we've got Haas. Uh, sort of, um, it, it gets a bit repetitive, basically saying that you know they didn't have a very good weekend, but I think it was actually one of the highest one of the higher prefer- um, finishes out of uh, Mazepin and Mick Schumacher. Um, Tom, uh, do, you, do you kind of feel like uh, Mick's kind of getting his um, 
his crashes out the way nowadays because we saw him have a, a small incident. I can't remember who with, unfortunately, but losing his front wing um, did an excellent job, in my opinion, to, to bring the car back um, and actually still stay in the race. Uh, bearing in mind, we've seen even the, the uh, sorry, the great uh, Fernando Alonso uh, managed to put that in the wall um, with a wing underneath. Um, do you think it's sort of, uh, do you think there's anything to be had out of, um, out of Qatar for the two? Honestly, probably not. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pretend there is. I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but that's okay. Me, we all do. It's, yeah, <laughs> let me just rattle through the list. We know how bad the car is. Um, covered that off. We know Haas are focusing all on 2022. Covered that off. Um, we know Mazepin is there because of money. Covered that off. Um, we know Schumacher is the angel driver and must put into the devil driver cover that off um is that a full house i don't know but is that five i think, I I think so I, I think we're close enough running out of fingers there one no <laughs> yeah i was gonna say unfortunately yeah. i'm not from norfolk <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh i'm gonna step out of that one um yeah, me too <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but uh, but um i just want to re- to go over something that I said and I'm resting my hands like this because I'm going to get a bit passionate now um, so buckle up for our audio listeners I'm Welsh and I wear my heart on my sleeve um, it is time it has been time for a while to give Mazepin a break to stop with the incessant uh, abuse he gets I'm not saying to go and offer him smooches every race but imagine if you were in his position, you've got the son of a seven-time world champion who is adored by everyone, who has this incredible bond with um, Vettel, who, you know, who, who, who has been taken under Vettel's wing, if you like, and who gets portrayed as, as, as this sort of like outstanding character, which, which Mick Schumacher is, and he is an F2 champion. And then... You've come in largely, very largely due to the influence, the financial influence your father's had on the team. And you've done a couple of unsavory actions off track. I'm going to leave that bit at that. I'm not going over that again. It's been nearly a year. But imagine if you turned up to the racetrack every weekend, knowing you were going to go out in Q1, knowing you were going to get lapped twice, possibly three times maybe even four times, knowing that the car you're, you're driving is so slow and is not going to get any quicker. Imagine how demoralising that would be, regardless of how much they get paid. Imagine how hard that would be, even though... And imagine that with all the pressure of social media on top of you, that's going to break most people. And Mazepin is trying with what he's got. I'm not saying he's going to be a world champion. But if anybody saw how passionate he got after Q1 when he started crying, if that doesn't show you that that kid is trying and cares, then you're not a proper fan of F1. Yeah, I think it's an important point you make, actually. Um, and it's one I hadn't considered, but... Uh too hard to be honest um, that's fault on me um that's been almost been a pantomime villain uh, as you say and to be fair to be fair to him um the the improvement we've seen is has been fairly good i'd say adam um would you agree yeah I, as you know as tom said it, it's it's hard to strip away a lot of the reasons why people weren't fans from Mazepin from day one, which of course was self-inflicted. And, you know, I'm not going to get into that either because that's a very touchy subject. And, you know, that's a debate for a different kind of podcast. Probably not um, the best not, phrase, Adam. No, it, it's not. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I can't think of a better way to put it other than just say, look, it, it, you know, that aside, um, with all due respect, and of course we shouldn't, you know, commend that kind of behavior. Of course not. Um, but at the same time, if we just talk about Mazepin, the driver, um, from the start of the same, at the start of the season, you know, spinning off at Bahrain after three corners and becoming a bit of a meme, and everyone thinking, 
you know, this is a guy that whilst he did impress in F2 in stages, he wasn't quite at the level of the likes of Mick Schumacher or the driver that a lot of people felt he bought the seat from or bought the seat uh, away from uh, in Callum Mylot. And, you know, there, as a result of that, there's a level of disdain for a driver like that. And it's quite easy to jump on the bandwagon to criticise him at every opportunity when he messes up. You know, it's almost a losing battle for Mazepin what he's up against um, in terms of, you know, the driving element. But over the course of the season, you're right, he has made some subtle improvements. He has been getting a bit quicker. He's still not quite on the pace of his teammate, um, at, you know, amongst other things. But we're seeing less and less, I suppose, of those unsavory moments behind the wheel from Mazepin. I, I think one comes to mind was Zandvoort when I think him and Schumacher were having a little battle there and he almost drove into him there. I think Baku, of course, he almost put Schumacher in the wall in that run to the line. We're seeing a lot less of that from Nikita Mazepin. That's not necessarily because he's he's always last, um, but he's just concentrating on his own driving and he is trying. He is trying to improve. Um, will he get the time beyond his current contract to do that? I don't know. It depends on, probably will depend on how much more money uh, the Mazepin family and um, Ural Kali, I think it is, that sort of backs them, um, are able to put into the Haas team. And again, it depends on their own future. We'll have to wait and see. But I think if you want to judge Nikita Mazepin on the driver, um, I think perhaps it's time that we should give him credit where it's due and that he has made improvements. And hopefully for his sake and Haas's as well, that continues into 2022. When we have that reset, we may find that those regulations bear in mind the cars are going to be heavier the cars are going to be new they're going to be uncomfortable for some people to drive it might bring in the junior drivers the former f2 drivers like schumacher and joe and uh, and mazapin and sonoda they may find these new cars a little bit easier to them to drive and more comfortable than some of the more veteran drivers that are used to driving the cars that we have today so i suppose that's the reason if anything i can think of for mazapin to be positive about i think that is that is it really yeah, um, to be Did fair. I to myself? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, no I, I just I, I just want to add to the back of that very quickly. Um, you made some really good points there, Adam. And when you said about sort of stripping away everything, let's not forget that when when we've had other back market teams who've been pretty poor, I'm thinking back to the likes of 2010 when we had HRT, um, Marussia and... Um, Virgin Racing, all that. They were at least racing against themselves. Has to have no one to race against other than themselves. And that's why we don't get to see what those drivers are really made of because they don't get the opportunity to show their wheel-to-wheel racing because the car isn't there. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. Um, And that's the important thing. You know, you've got to remember that Mazepin is only up against his teammate. You know, and we're going to see how good Mick Schumacher really is as well next season. Um, You know, it's quite easy for a lot of people to sort of overestimate his abilities a little bit because of who he is and who his dad is and, you know, his junior career. But of course, in Formula One, that means almost nothing. You have to go there and deliver. And next season, we might see them two a lot closer together than we have done this season. And hopefully for their sake, a lot closer to everybody else as well. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I think I, I mean it. I, I, it'd be amazing if Haas didn't move forward based on what they've got, uh, based on what on the kind of investment that we think is being put into the twenty twenty two car. Speaking of, um, it's it's a point you just sort of touched on. Really, is that the the it, there's a bit of a obviously there's a rules reset. And it's going to be difficult um, for all drivers to transition to them. But bearing in mind that um, F two has been racing on these what uh, these sort of bigger rims and 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 more sort of. Uh, road-like tyres, uh, road-relevant tyres, sorry. And obviously F1 is moving to the uh, to those. Um, I just kind of, I'll do this in the main show really, but um, do, you, do you think sort of that's almost a, a benefit to them in the same way that the banning of traction control uh, in 2008 was to maybe Lewis Hamilton, where obviously, you know, you've got these incumbent drivers who who have, have been used to it for the last couple of years of, or, or their entire careers potentially. Um and now, the, you know, the young kids, are, you know, the young guys coming up from F2, you know, I'm thinking Sonoda, I'm thinking Schumacher, I'm thinking uh, Mazepin as well. And whoever ends up in the Alfa, uh, Alfa Romeo seat, do you think that's, I mean, I'll start with, I guess, I'll start it over to you, Tom. Um, but do you think that's, you know, going to be much more of a advantage than, we, than we're thinking? 
Uh, it could be, yeah. Um, and let's not forget, sort of, you know, even even taking that in, into consideration, let's not forget how big the jump from F2 to F1 really is. I'm not just talking about the cars, I'm talking about the environment, the pressure, the media spotlight. Um, so when you take all of these things in, in, into consideration, plus you know, you know, plus plus the the bigger tires. Yes, okay, they, they are apparently going to be more road relevant next year. I don't know about you, but every time I, I want to go to Tesco, I don't go downstairs and put tire blankets on my car and then have a Jackman front and rear ready to wheel me out the garage. Um, you know, so take from it what you will. Oh, and also, if you try and drive with slicks on in the UK, you'll get your car impounded because it is illegal. Um, <sighs> yes, I, I I I can see where where you're coming from, um, but it's um yeah it, it in terms of like drivers coming up from F two to F one, it's a huge step for them. Yeah, uh, uh, no, I agree with you. Uh, I think um, no, sorry to hijack it again, uh, a wine. Um, but as I said, you know, these cars are going to be heavier next season. They're going to be more lazier in the slower corners, if you like. And um, there's going to be a lot less downforce. It's going to be a lot harder for, um, you know, for the guys that are used to the current cars to sort of adjust. And I think for drivers like Joe, for Schumacher and Mazepin and Sonoda, as I've already mentioned, those guys are going to, find it a little bit more easier to acclimatize to these newer cars coming just because of their experiences in F2. I mean, apparently these cars are going to be very, very close to performance of the current ones. Um, the latest uh, news that we've heard, you know, before they were saying three or four seconds slower, they were going to be like really fast F2 cars. Now they said they're going to be faster than that. Either way, I think for those guys, they're going to be very much looking forward to these new cars. I think that's what they were brought in for originally, because of course the rules were homologated a year back. So they come in a year earlier than they thought they were going to for these new rules. So, um, yeah, it, it could be quite interesting to see what progress these younger drivers uh, from F2 make of these new rules. They may, you know, find it a lot easier to acclimatise than the uh, the more veteran ones, if you like. Yeah, I've sort of hijacked the, uh, the format of my own podcast there. Um, but... Uh... But yeah, um, I think that's sort of, a, you know, we've just had a quick sort of mini discussion on it, but it's so, you know, it's an interesting prospect coming up. Um, I would say uh, now we should probably move on to some predictions because uh, uh, I'm assuming your producer will be very annoyed at me for this. Um, but uh, I, I, I think I, yeah, I'm just going to go with the headline, headline prediction. Um, who do we think is going to win the uh, win the Qatar Grand Prix? Um, I'll start with you, Adam. Lewis. I, I think... The characteristics of the circuit, as we've already talked about, and how quick Lewis has been, if that engine holds up in terms of reliability, I think it's going to be really tough to stop him. Um, and that's assuming he starts where he should start, at the very front of the grid this time. Yeah, it's a good point you make. Um, Tom? Uh, it's got to be Lewis for for um, Qatar. Circuit's going to suit Merck, mostly. Um, he's He's going to be... He's going to have such a buzz and he, the the momentum and the sort of energy he's carrying from Brazil. It's um yeah, it's got to be Lewis. Yeah, it's not really. Mine's mine's not a prediction really. It's more of a it's more of a get. It's more of an assumption really that Lewis will be on top. But I think you know, the, I think the 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 you know as you say the buzz. Um, you know that the. the that Max Verstappen may not believe in momentum. I don't know who tr how true that is. Uh, whether he's you know feeling the pressure maybe and not showing it, or or whether he genuinely feels that way. But I think there's a lot to be said for coming in with form, coming in with you know feeling like oh I can accomplish anything, and I think I might do it. Um, who do we think is going to? Well, actually, it's a stupid question, isn't it? <laughs> he's probably going to share the po po uh, podium with one of the three other drivers. Um, and uh, and we have a good idea of who, who who one of them is, but we'll do it just out of interest anyway. Uh, Adam, who do you think is going to be on the other two steps of the podium? Well, you got to go with Max and Valtteri. I was almost tempted to try and be silly and name someone random. Let's name Mazepin on the podium for the sake of improvement. Why not? No, it, it's got to be Max and Valtteri. Um, um, I mean, Perez could, but I just think the strengths of that Mercedes are going to suit Bottas a lot more than the strengths of the Red Bull in Perez. So, uh, yeah, I think Max and Valtteri. And you, Tom? Uh, 
I think in 2021 style, if you're putting Hamilton on the podium, you've got to put Max on the podium and vice versa. So, yes, Max, I think, will be on the podium, bar no major incident. Um, but I do think we're going to see a Mercedes power car. And at the minute, I, only, I can only see Bottas getting it up there. Fair enough. Um, you know, it's not really a prediction. This isn't. A, this is even less of a prediction. I, I, this is just a hope. I'd like to see the, the constructors' championship be uh, be very, very tightly decided. So I'd, I'd quite like to see Perez up there just to bring back the points deficit just a little bit. Uh, back towards Mercedes. Back towards uh, evening up those two. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with Verstappen because I don't think I don't see anyone else being second, and obviously Perez behind there. Um, I think there's a bold prediction to make, really. Um, but we'll go with one ev- en- uh, anyway. Uh, Adam, you got a bold prediction? Um, bold prediction, bold prediction. I'm going to go with... Because I'm thinking like Mexico, I'm going to go with Gasly P4. I think Gasly will beat the Ferraris again this weekend. I mean, he's been a phenomenal qualifier um, this season. And he's always put himself there or thereabouts. Brazil, it fell away a bit because of the performance of the Ferrari, but... It's a good car that he's got underneath, and he seems to extract that. So, yeah, I'm going to say Gasly P4. Tom? Uh, I'm going to say McLaren gets to within five points of the con- of Ferrari and the constructors. Oh, that's a that's a bold one, that. Well, after uh, the can- race, that's a huge chunk of points. I know. <laughs> Wow, I mean, I'm curious to ask what you think Ferrari's going to do this weekend. I don't imagine a lot on that basis. They're going to be Italian. They'll do something stupid. Yeah, I mean, you said it. I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All hate directed at me, please. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> not at me. <laughs> they'll, build that, they'll build that Ferrari with uh, with passion, or maybe it'll get affected in shipping. Who knows? Yeah. Um, and it will blow up and lap three in a giant fireball. Well, uh, the freight planes actually make it to this event. You know that we could turn up to it. That would be how it works, Tom. Yeah, Ferrari <laughs> yeah, just right. getting their car put together because the freight plane doesn't make it. That's how it happens. <laughs> They'd be quicker off driving it down the motorway from Maranello at that rate. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I believe, uh, I believe uh, Qatar Airways are hoping uh, doing the logistics, uh, doing the actual flights. This uh, that's what I read earlier today. Um, oh, bold prediction. I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with both Ferraris in the top four. That's a bold one, I think. Could happen. Bold one. I like it, but yeah, that is a bold one. Yeah, uh, and with that, uh, it's getting a bit late. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but you'll know if you're watching live, but if you're listening after the fact, uh, we now stream the show live on YouTube, so be sure to like our Facebook page, as I said before, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Formula One Grid Talk, uh, to know when we go live and when we're scheduling shows. Uh, there's a fair few still coming up. Um, this is We're get, getting off the back of a, uh, of a, of a long set of... Uh, a long set of them, but we're over the hump now. And, uh, we're coming back down the other side. Um, make sure you just bring the bell icon so you're notified of future shows when they go live uh, and when we get when we upload um, some extra bits, some you know clips and stuff like that. I'm sure this generated probably some. Um, so if you but if you want to listen to it in audio format, then uh, and we're now available on verbal as well as Amazon Music, YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Omni Studio, and Pocket Cast. Just search F1 Grid Talk. Uh, we have a large get back catalogue of shows, particularly chronicling this marvel of a season. Uh, it's a it's a great companion piece if you want to go back and uh, watch the replays of the season and then uh, and then listen to our lovely voices all over again. Uh, we have 150 now, um, including interviews with Mario Isola uh, from Pirelli, as well as retrospective pieces on. Tiregate, the 1994 Benefit Tom Conspiracy, and Senna. Uh, and if you're still stuck to, uh, for what to do between shows, um, then I'm sure there's uh, my, my lovely podcast guest, who I, I thank profusely for coming on at this uh, this sort of later stage at night, um, will uh, will be there to entertain you. So uh, if we start with you, Adam, where, where can we find you? So you can find us on the DNF1 F1 podcast. Same as F1 Chronicle, you search us on Google, type in DNF1, you'll find us and you'll be able to listen to us on all major podcasts and platforms as well, where we talk all the latest news and gossip and events in Formula One. And you, Tom? Yes, so I'm part of Everything F1. You can find us at everythingf1.com across all your favourite social media platforms, so Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. I believe we might even be doing TikTok. As you can tell, I am not a TikTok connoisseur. 
Um, we also have a Discord server and a YouTube channel uh, where we do uh, sort of track analysis, um, sort of like uh, previewing uh, previewing circuits, recommend races, and we are going to begin uploading interviews of our podcast, the Everything of Fun podcast. Now, that podcast is available on Amazon, Spotify, Apple, um, I think Omni Studio, basically all your favourite podcast locations, and our website. Yeah, it's great. To, great. Uh, everyone check those out. They are really, really good. Um, right. If, uh, if, lastly, uh, just uh, if you want to sort of help us out to improve, just check out our separate F1 Grid Talk to uh, to give us suggestions on what we can do. Uh, and perhaps subscribe to our Patreon for mics, lights and better recording equipment, particularly the lights. It's not particularly well lit in this uh, in this room at this time of day uh, for our presenters. Um, we'll be back. Oh, I believe it's next Saturday uh, for the Qatar qualifying um, to give our analysis and reaction to that as well. Um, Thank you very much for watching and goodbye. Ah, there we go. Uh, It's really late. Unfortunately, I pushed the discussion a bit longer than I sort of meant to there. Um, Just quickly, uh, have you guys read the news that um, there's a rumoured Audi takeover of the McLaren F1 team? Yeah, um, um, McLaren have said it's not happening. Ah, there we go. That's as uh, far that sort of as that we one out. know. As far um, as we know. As far as we know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, sometimes these things are always like, no, no, it's definitely not happening. I mean, it's come from somewhere because everybody's talking about it. It's not like one of those off the mill things. It's just found its way through. It's like, bam, out of nowhere. So, ah. No smoke without fire. Exactly. And, and with McLaren, there's been a lot of talk about you know, easing their own financial burdens. Of course, they put up their technology center, didn't they? They sold it and then they've got a long lease on that. So there's obviously a desire there to try and get some sort of immediate funding. And I think they are looking for some sort of powertrain partner beyond Mercedes, perhaps. Um, The Volkswagen group coming in, of course, in the next five years or so with the new engine rig. So they might be trying to test the waters and see perhaps one of Audi or Porsche or something like that might be interested in a partnership which suits them because they're obviously looking for a team to buy into in f1 as well yeah. well i thought wag group were getting or wag group whatever they're called were getting in bed with red bull was the last i heard i think porsche might be um audi yeah. obviously might be looking elsewhere uh, i suppose you've got to take the different brands yeah yeah and i think porsche it's mostly just taking over from what honda have done that red bull will be sort of looking after as a bit of a custodian and working with over the next few years. And then of course, Porsche will just jump in and add their expertise to that as F1 goes a bit more greener um, 2026 onwards. So yeah, there's definitely room for Audi um, and with the money issues at McLaren, it makes sense for that to happen. So I wouldn't be surprised if we heard more of this in the next coming months, perhaps. Yeah. I'll tell you what constructor I'd like to see or manufacturer I'd like to see join McLaren. And maybe I'm saying this because I bought my fourth one a few weeks ago, BMW. Oh yeah, they back need in F one BMW. Yeah, but I, mean, I, I, I just don't think they'll do it. No, no, that's how F one is now. It's like you can't enter a team into the sport because you have to fork out at least two hundred million just to get in, yep. because you've got to pay all the other teams that are already in there to get into the sport, and then you've got to delay, um, getting a certain amount of revenue for the first year or so. So it's like you're you're three hundred million pounds de- or dollars down after the first year without even doing anything. Yeah, although with the, with the budget cap, it is going to help a bit. But. It is, but I don't know if I was a, you know, we, we've got for the first one of the first times in history that, uh, well, sorry, first time in recent history that, for, uh, you know, I mean, if if, if Ferrari for for argument's sake are going back into endurance racing at the top class, I think that says a lot about where where manufacturers are more likely to go just based on return on investment. Yeah. And I think Ferrari can afford to do that as well. You know, now that the budget cap, they don't have to allocate as much to F1 as they probably wanted to. But yeah, you know, so that's a bit of relief. But I just think these companies now are just going to look to buy into teams that are sort of struggling with money issues and need a buy. I think that's their route in now. I don't think we're going to see new teams joining the sport, which is a shame because I think F1 needs at least two more teams. Yeah, um, I agree. That's the current climate of F1. Until they waive that $200 million buy-in, you're not going to get a new team coming to the sport. No. It just makes no sense to do that, especially if they're independently backed rather than a manufacturer. That's over a year's 
What's the, what's the budget cap's what one four five mil. Yeah, so yeah. that's another what like. Oh gosh, I should know the figures you, off the top of my head. Yeah, it, it's it's roughly About an a extra. Third of it. It. Yeah, I was gonna say it's another for, for thirty to forty percent of it again. You know, yeah. one hundred and forty percent of of your of your potential running costs. So yeah, so yeah, I, that's. A... I'll tell you what F one needs. It needs. No, I know Red Bull have got it with Alpha Tauri, but teams that have young driver academies, specifically Mercedes, Ferrari, and Alpine, they need a junior team. They need a baby team where a driver can join that team from an academy, from F2, especially if they win F2. Um, They can join that team knowing that they're going to be there to develop for a few years and then if space becomes available at a top team, they move up to the top team, like we've seen with um, with Toro Rosso, Alfa Tari. Maybe don't do it quite the way Red Bull do it, because whilst they've had some amazing drivers, they shot themselves in the foot after they got rid of Albon, because um, they had no bugger left. Um, yeah. Or certainly with Freddy. They, if you look at Ferrari, they're practically chipping over young drivers at the moment. Yeah, the only problem with Ferrari though is that other than Callum Mylot, they don't really have anyone good enough right now to sort of make that jump in F one. I mean, I think. Do you know what I'm Robert Schwartzman? Ah, uh, do you know what? I've watched him this season, and I backed him to win the F two title at the start of the season because I thought he looks the best driver out of the bunch um, that's in there. Um, naturally, because the other two that were better than him had gone into Formula One. Uh, sorry, not you know Mazepin, but I mean, uh, sorry, I meant Eilot and Schumacher. And Mazepin obviously went there as well, which helped, but. Um, yeah, I've been a bit disappointed with Robert Schwartzman. I think that also the spread between races this season has really hurt. It's, it's really screwed um, over. The, yeah. yeah. So someone like Robert Schwartzman, who had a bit of a slow start, he's had a hard time. So he's got back into it, but there's no momentum. Um, and he's always looked second best to Piastri. So for me, I just feel that, you know, I just don't, I don't know. I'm not convinced that he's going to be ultimately good enough for Ferrari to sort of trust in Formula One to sort of be an option in the future. Not that I think he will be, but um, there's a lot of good drivers there at Ferrari. I just don't think there's any sort of star or in waiting. Um, I think the only one is probably Piastri that I can think of. Perhaps someone like Liam Lawson in due course um, or Dennis Halger, maybe. You know, I'd be interested to see how he gets in an F2. So Red Bull are in a healthy position. Yeah, Red Bull, give it a couple of years because Gasly's not going to stay there for that much longer. Mm. Give it a couple of years and he, and he'll be moving on to somewhere else. I'm still I'm still saying Gasly should wait until Hamilton retires and then move to Mercedes. Yeah, I like but the sound of that, yeah. I, don't get me wrong, I would love to see that because I really, really rate Gasly. But Will Mercedes take two drivers and have and run the risk of it being 2016 all over again? Well, there could always be the option that they might take Ocon and then put Gasly in the Alpine. You know, because I know that connection's not exactly True. broken. True. It's not um, number two to Russell, isn't it? Yeah, but would Ocon go there to be the number two? I think Although, oh, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I've interrupted myself there as well as you. <laughs> sorry, Adam. Um, as I said, that I realised. You're gonna have more chance of Ocon being a number two than you are Gasly. Mm. No, but that's what I mean. I think you know, I totally get it. Ocon doesn't want to be a number two. I mean, he's a number two in his own team for the moment, technically. But um, it, obviously, you know, if Mercedes perform as we expect them to, compared to Alpine beyond 2022, there's always going to be that appeal for them. As I said, lots of things. I mean, Mercedes, they're, they've not really got anyone either. Was they got Frederick Vesti? I think is the next driver on their program, or David Beckman. You know, is, Pe- is Beckman a Mercedes driver? I'm not sure. I'm sure someone said he was, but I'm not convinced. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm going to Google it while, while we talk about it quickly. I'm probably so what wrong. With Ak- uh, 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 sorry, Jack Aitken. Uh, he, he was he Williams. Was. Yeah, is he still at Williams or is he left them now? Because I know they got rid of Dan Tictum. Yeah, but Dan Tictum's a, just a helmet. Um, yeah, it's a shame. A lot of talent, but just you just can't manage it. L- a lot of talent, too much attitude. Mm. Um, you know, we all, you know, I'm presuming we all saw his Scooby Dooby Doo song by the yeah, TV. But I mean, even then, that was, I mean, that was silly. Um, that, that was just immature. 
Yeah, of course it was immature, but um, I, I don't think ultimately that's what happened, why they separated with Williams. I no, was, he, he, he'd already separated by then. Apparently. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, he just wanted this. He knew he wasn't going to get a seat there and he just decided to go. But yeah, it's a shame because as you said, there's a lot of talent there. But, you know, there was a time when people were talking about him rather than Lando Norris. And obviously we've seen over the years which one has made the step forward. And obviously McLaren took the punt on the right driver, obviously. So... I don't know, Mercedes do need to look for the next big thing because, as I said, I think Vesti is their next driver on their radar. But other than that, I can't think of who else is in their academy that springs to mind as an option. And even then, you know, I don't think Vesti's anywhere near ready for an F1 seat. No. So at the moment, they've obviously got George Russell. They've then got Andrea Antonelli, um, who is, he's only in Italian F4 though. Oh, he's out of carts now. I thought he was still in carts. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, actually, it says current season. He's in European. He's in Euro Karts, okay. Italian F4. I wonder if he's doing like the last two rounds in F4 or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, right. They've then got Paul Aaron, who are going to be honest, these drivers I'm going to name now, other than Vest, I've not heard of. Um, Paul Aaron is Estonian. Um, he is oh. racing, he's in Formula Regional European Championships. Mm, I've heard Alex of Powell, who is currently in. Um, Karting, the Europeans. Uh, Fred Vesti, we know, is in F3. And they've got... Uh, Fred Vesti signed this year. And they've got... Oh, God, here we go. Um, Yuan Pu Kui. I don't know if I said that properly. I sincerely apologise if not. Um, a, a I can actually watch him right now. <laughs> he's uh, he's <laughs> losing yeah. it over that pronunciation. He's just like, <laughs> yeah. he, can't, he can't believe yeah, it. Still Please live. forgive me. Yeah. We are still live, by the way. Just Yeah. To, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he, uh, so he is uh, he's a Chinese driver who was signed this year and is racing in karts. And Ocon officially left in 2019. Um, and obviously the one and only Pascal Verlein left in 2018. Yeah. So, yeah, That's there's plenty of Yeah. I, I, I always like Verlein. Yeah, it's funny that because I always thought we seemed destined to be what Ocon was and then Ocon come along and it just completely changed everything, didn't it, when he was yeah. in the manor? And yeah. I didn't think Ocon was as amazing as people were saying he was when he was in the manor compared to Verline. I thought Verline had him like the better of him, obviously with the experience, yeah. but they obviously saw something that we didn't and that's why he's in where he is now. So shows what I know, Yeah, which isn't a lot. I've just remembered Nick DeFries. <laughs> Yeah, Do you know, I think there were a lot of rumors or a lot of things floating around for a while that he was going to get the um, the second Williams seat, and it seemed pretty set on that he was going to get it at one point because obviously the Mercedes ties. Yeah. So when when Albon went there, I was really sorry, someone is on my t shirt. That is on my t shirt. Fuck. Well, I um, can't see it, so I don't think anyone else can either. So you're sorry. right. Tom. If you say you're all good, <laughs> it must be when I was dribbling on the train. Green. Um, <laughs> no, it's um. Yeah, no, uh, Nick DeVries, I think, has possibly been a bit unlucky here if he hasn't got that second Alfa Romeo seat. So I'm just conscious of the time. Um, go away, I was going to say, I'm just, just, I've got, yeah, it's probably a good idea to wrap, uh, to wrap it up now. Yeah, anyway. so one, one question to wrap up, and I don't want this to drag on if possible. Who do you think Alfa Romeo have signed for the second seat? What, next season? Oh, Guan Yu Zhou. Yep. I think Absolutely. it's almost inevitable. I mean, that teaser that we saw on social media with that shop in China. Yeah. Showing up on the show. I think that when you see those things, those guys know. It's like when you see leaks online, of like the leak of the Ferrari earlier the season when we saw the Green Mission win our logo and everyone thought, that's got to be fake. There's no way. And then, whoop de And then it you know. turns up with one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Leaks are a lot more reliable than they used to be now. So I would take that as uh, almost yeah, the confirmation. Leaks. In yeah. some, yeah, with respect, of course. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just it like when the, when the new sour livery was leaked. Oh god, yeah. And, oh, and, and the, and the 2022 car was leaked. Mm. I will say I don't know too much about the uh, about who's going in because I, I honestly haven't paid enough attention to it. But all I will say is, if they've got a big poster of it. I know, you know, sometimes people are very, very good at Photoshop, but if it's in a it, if it's in a shop and sort of that that sort of thing, it's usually been on the cards for a long time because that, that, that's a lot of stuff to get that sort of get ready. stuff moving. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. just mock up one of those posters overnight. 
Mm. Um, so I know are either of you two football fans? Yeah, I've got the England game on my. I was going to say, have you seen oh, the no. score? I yeah. uh, I've heard the first yeah. half score uh, of a, of my housemate. Um, apparently, it's it was good, a yeah. bit a bit tight. Uh, but uh, sorry if you were waiting for the score, but uh, it's no, a bit tight. no, 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 no. I was going to say six 0 in the first half. You know, that's a, that's a really close game, Matt. Yeah, uh, it's currently ten. It was eleven, but they had one disallowed. Goodness <laughs> me, oh, isn't it but, playing Albania? Mm-hmm. Uh, San Marino. Oh, yeah. San Marino. Oh, what well, to be fair? But... I like that San Marino kit. It's got Bradford vibes about it. It's nicer than their old one. They've obviously spent a bit San of money Mar- on this kit. If it's if you know if they're playing San Marino, are they not playing just Italy? But you know the B team. Well, the B team would be quite generous. I mean, that's that's Formula One yeah. rules. That for uh, for naming a for naming a uh, <laughs> team. <laughs> it's, yeah. I suppose it's probably the equivalent for like picking an F three team, like not a good one either. I'm not going to name one because I don't want to be rude to them because they're all, you know, doing their job. Well, I venture uh, racing. Uh, well, you said it, not me, but let's do venture <laughs> niggle, shall we? Up against Mercedes at Brazil. It's kind of the equivalent of that. It's like, stop the game. He's always, they're probably asking the referee, do you want to stop, like, a Sunday league game? Like, can we stop the game a bit earlier? Like, no one will care, you know, but... It, it, it reminds me of when I was playing a rugby game growing up in school and we were 58 nil up after 35 minutes. Oh, wow. It was just like, it was like, stop, stop. He's already dead. Did you feel like the All Blacks? Uh, the school I played for, we were a bit like that. That's, um, yeah, the, um, I think they called, if I remember right, they called the game after 60 minutes because it was just, it, it was just like, there's no point. I normally say don't turn turn your back on a team in rugby, but there are times when you're just like, okay, maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I remember one of our wings knocking it on over the line on purpose because he felt bad. <laughs> you just sit and have a little cup of tea and just think, yeah, it's fine. Don't need to play anymore. We're good. No, that's, basically, that's basically what it was, yeah. But there we are. Yeah. Right. I better wrap it up. Uh, thank you. If you're yeah. still with us on the live stream and you're just listening to it, we've actually increased in viewership. It's ridiculous. Uh, if you're still with us on the live stream, uh, thank you very much. We will be back, as I say, on Saturday at some point. I don't know the times off the top of my head. Uh, but to uh, to review the uh, qualifying for uh, the Qatar Grand Prix, I think it's a slightly changed uh, way, order of things there, but uh, with with all the hosts, hosts and things like that. But uh, we will have a show. So uh, see us then. Um, thank you for watching. And goodbye. Bye-bye.